Well, good evening, everyone. Can you hear me? Great, thank you. Welcome to our Explore Lakes with New Hampshire Lakes webinar series this evening. Uh, I'm Andrea Lamoureux with New Hampshire Lakes, um, and I'm pleased tonight to bring you um, the New Hampshire's Changing Climate and Changing Lakes webinar. Before we get into the, the the, nitty, the presentation itself, I just wanted to go over a few housekeeping rules. And for those of you who have been with us uh, for our series, this will be um, old hat to you at this point. But this meeting is being recorded. Yep, I just checked, it's being recorded. Um, participants, uh, you will be muted for the duration of the webinar. We'll have about, uh, we have 90 people signed up today. So we'll keep the airwaves clear uh, for um, our presenters. You're welcome to leave your camera on. Again, just remember if you do, others can see you. Um, Please submit your questions throughout the presentation in the chat box and uh, Crystal and Jessica, you can give a wave. Crystal and Jessica will man the chat box doing their best to answer your questions and saving the tough ones for our, our expert tonight. And uh, uh, as usual, about 15 minutes after this session, you'll receive an email from me inviting you to evaluate the session. Let us know what you liked, what, what else you wanna learn. Um, we're always trying to um, bring topics to you guys that, that you want to know about. Uh, tomorrow, actually, you will then receive an email from me in, um, with the links to this recording and the links to the slides that will be posted on our website. So you can see them again or share those with someone you know who couldn't turn in tonight, tune in tonight. Uh, most of you are probably fairly familiar uh, with, with the Zoom these days, but um, how to chat, um, look down at the, the lower part of your screen and you should see this little chat bubble with a couple uh, dots on it. And if you click on that, it'll open up a, a chat box and you can direct your comments to everyone. Everyone will be able to see your, your questions. And then again, Crystal and Jessica will do their best to answer your questions. So your host this evening, um, again, uh, I'm Andrea Lamro, and we've got Crystal and Jessica um, on the conservation team here at New Hampshire Lakes. And for those of you who are new to New Hampshire Lakes, we are a statewide member supported nonprofit organization and we work for all of New Hampshire's 1000 lakes. We have many members um, on the call uh, this evening, including several board members. So thank you all for your support. Your support makes this work that we do possible. If you aren't a member, we, we do encourage you to consider becoming a member. Um, go to our website at nhlakes.org and learn more about what we do and how we work with you for clean and healthy lakes. Um, again, it's our members that help us bring um, this type of programming to you, so thank you. Our mission, simply put, is to keep lakes clean and healthy now and in the future. And we work with a variety of partners, including state agency um, staff like Sherry here. And um, we work with municipalities, local groups, all to help keep our lakes clean and healthy for everyone to enjoy today and in, in the future. If you know us at all, you may know us through our Lake Host program, our most popular conservation program out on the ground. We um, staff boat ramps throughout the state, helping boaters take simple actions to keep our lakes clean and healthy and free from invasive species. And we do advocacy at the state house and we do outreach. And in a normal summer, we visit communities throughout the state and bring hands-on programs and activities to, to youth and their, their families. Couldn't quite do that this year, but we then came up with the idea of uh, weekly webinars during the summer and now monthly webinars during the downtime. So thank you for tuning in tonight. Please tune in and register for um, our next one in January. Crystal and I will be presenting about all the fascinating things about lakes in winter. Um, and I'll just give you a, a heads up in February, we're going to have an awesome presentation about bald eagles and New Hampshire's lakes. So again, you can find out all about see past presentations and register for future presentations at our website. But with no further ado, I'm so pleased to have Sherry Godlewski with us uh, this evening and she's gonna 
spend the bulk of the presentation this evening uh, bringing us all up to speed on climate change, um, what that means, what's happening in New Hampshire and, and what we can do about it. And I'll round out the presentation with just some specific um, information about our lakes. So Sherry, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and you should be able to share yours. All right, it looks great. And now I think I'll just wanna take yourself off of mute and you're be ready to go. Yep, that helps when you're a speaker to come off mute. Thank you, Andrea, for the tip. Um, good evening, everybody. Thank you for inviting me to be here with you tonight. I'm going to talk a little bit about climate change globally and then look at what's happening in our country and also what's happening, happening in New Hampshire. And today I would like to help you make the connections about what you see around you and how it shows us that our climate is changing. Okay, I am... There we go. All right, so this illustrates what happened to our country last year. There were 14 separate billion dollar weather and climate disasters that occurred around the state, around our country. And it totaled $45 billion in costs to recover from these disasters. And it was interesting because 2019 marked the fifth consecutive year in which we had 10 or more separate billion dollar events happening in our country. And these happen in New Hampshire too. And many of us who've lived here for a long time say, yeah, I remember this happening often. And sure, if you look at the 50 years between 1953 and 2002, in that 50 year period, we had 15 disaster declarations and three emergency declarations. But if we look in the more recent past, in the, in the 16 years between 2003 and 2018, we saw 21 disaster declarations of various types as well as 10 emergency declarations. So we're seeing more of these disasters happening in our state than we did in the past. And these events are very, very inconvenient, but they're also very expensive. And what this slide shows us is the federal dollars that we requested to recover from these events specifically for New Hampshire. And I normalized all these dollars to 2017 dollars so we can compare apples to apples. We see the 1998 ice storm there, but then we see something happening right around 2003, 2005. We're seeing almost a need for federal help annually. So we're seeing these disasters annually. And while the federal government through FEMA does provide us with recovery money, it doesn't provide us with 100% of the costs. So we have to provide at least 25% of the cost for each of the disasters that we, we are impacted by in New Hampshire. And now let's look at this year and what this year has been like. So first, let me orient you to these, these images. The top image is looking at average temperatures. So anything you see that's white is near average. Anything pink to red is above average to record warmth. Anything blue is below average and anything darker blue is record cold. So you can see that our country was pretty much above average in our section of the, of the country, we were much above average for January. And now in the image in the lower right, this is looking at precipitation and same sort of color scheme where white is average, anything blue to darker blue is wetter than average, anything light tan to darker brown is drier than average. So you can see that in New Hampshire, we had a hotter than average temperatures for January and we had lower than average snowfall. In the top of Coas County, they were about average, but for the rest of the state, it was low average snowfall. And then I don't know if you remember this day, but January 12th was a record breaking day. It was 70 degrees on my deck. I was barefoot in the middle of January. And you can see all the other records that were broken in New Hampshire and Vermont and Maine that day. So it was much warmer than your typical January thaw. And it's important to recognize that we're not just warming on our terrestrial areas, we're also warming in our ocean. The oceans absorb a fair amount of heat as we, as we put more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. In January 2020 was the planet's warmest January on record since record keeping began. 
And right after that warm January, there was a, a situation that we could never have managed, imagined. It was 68 degrees Fahrenheit on the, on, in Antarctica. And on the West Antarctic ice sheet, the Pine Island Glacier broke off a volume of 120 square miles. That's three times the area of the city of San Francisco. So it was a large piece of ice that came off the West Antarctic ice sheet. And scientists are watching this ice, this West Antarctic ice sheet because it is very, very unstable. And this 68 degree temperature didn't help. And then if we look to what else happened for this, this year, Again, we see looking at January to June, we had much above average temperatures and below average precipitation. And I'm showing this to help you see how we got set up for this drought. So a warmer than average year, below average precipitation. And then what was summer like? Well, this is my cat, Rudy, and he weighs 16 pounds. And he thinks that these summers have been way too hot. And Rudy's right because we are seeing increasing days over 90 degrees happening regularly, but more significantly, our nighttime temperatures are increasing at a faster rate. From 1940 to 2017, minimum temperatures have increased by 2.5 degrees Fahrenheit. And when we have this reduced nighttime cooling, it can have very, very serious public health effects. Concord had its fourth hottest summer on record with 25 days above 90 degrees, well, Manchester had 32 days above 90 degrees. That's a whole month above 90 degrees in New Hampshire. And this, this heat is coupled with smothering humidity and it's crushing the records in the Northeast. And we are just not used to living in a really hot and humid environment. And all indications are this is not going to change. We're gonna to continue to move in this warmer than average direction. And we've already seen more than a doubling of these high humid heat days here in the Northeast. And when you look at the whole summer in aggregate, the Northern Hemisphere had the warmest summer on record. And at that time, Berkoyansk, Russia, hit 104 degrees on June 20th. It's above the Arctic Circle. This is the highest temperature ever recorded in the Arctic since record keeping began. And now our Arctic area is warming three times faster than the rest of the world. And this particular location is 400 miles north of Anchorage, Alaska. And on this day, it was warmer in the Arctic Circle than it was in Dallas or Houston. And in fact, Russia and Siberia had higher than average temperatures for the first five months of the year. So we're seeing this warming in, in the Arctic and it's problematic because what happens when the Arctic warms, we're seeing a decrease in sea ice. And September 15th was the second lowest extent of sea ice in the 42 year satellite record. And you can see the record low there was in 2012 and look at how close we came in 2020. And this is a problem because when we lose sea ice, ice is white. And when the sun hits it, it reflects some of that heat back off into the atmosphere. But when we melt that ice, it shows ocean. And ocean is dark. And the dark ocean waters absorb the heat of that sun, and then they melt more ice. So it's this feedback loop that's really not helpful. And we consider the Arctic the, the air conditioner of the North. And by the end of October, Arctic sea ice still had not formed in Siberia, and that's the latest date on record. So we're seeing this extreme warming in the Arctic, and it does impact the climate down here as well. So let's come out of the Arctic and talk about what happened over the summer. We saw these intense western wildfires, which brought smoke all the way into New Hampshire, and we could see the hazy skies and vibrant sunsets. And when I saw this image on the upper left, I was just shocked to see the smoke spread across the entire country. At the same time, Hurricane Sally and Paulette are brewing in the Atlantic. So this was like the climate cataclysmic slide for me. I was just like, oh my goodness, look what's happening. And these wildfires are so intense where they hit locally, people are really suffering. But the image on the right, I want you to also understand is the air quality impacts that are associated with these wildfires. When we have wildfires, the smoke spreads obviously very far. And you see these different conditions located here where they're unhealthy for sensitive groups, unhealthy, very unhealthy and hazardous. And they're very widespread air quality impacts. In New Hampshire, we call an air quality action day when we're in the orange. 
So we have never experienced the red, the purple, or the deep purple, and you can't really go outside, and you certainly can't go outside and exercise. So add these air quality impacts with the current pandemic in large portions of our country, we're having a serious problem over the summer with air quality and the ability to bring, breathe clean air. And you know, may not think that New Hampshire is subject to fires, but we did have a number of fires this summer. And this is an image of the Merrimack River Island fire burning out of control in September. And then the fire chief from the White Mountain National Forest was reporting on a fire that had burned down two feet into the ground because there was no soil moisture. So the governor did issue a proclamation banning outdoor burning and smoking near woodlands, which was in helpful to, to decrease our potential of having extremely danger, dangerous wildfires. And that proclamation has been dropped because we've seen some precipitation, thankfully. So all that is what brought us kind of into this drought. And you see, we're still in the drought right now. Most of the state is either in moderate drought, that light tan color, or severe drought orange, or the red drought, the red color is extreme drought. And all those dots all over the map are water restrictions that communities have put on their customers. And we really need to pay attention to this because over 40% of our state lives on a private well. So you need to pay attention if you're in drought. And then a couple of weeks ago, we released a press release saying that we may be in risk of a multi-year drought as we head towards winter. Because if we freeze up, any precipitation we get is gonna run off. It's not gonna percolate into the ground. And if you look at the country, you see the same sorts of conditions in the Southwest where they are in exceptional drought. You see that D4, that dark brown. But the other thing I want you to see on this map is the S's and the L's. And the S indicates a short-term drought, less than six months, and L is a longer-term drought. And you would expect to see longer-term droughts in the Southwest, but look at the Northeast is looking at potentially a longer-term drought. And the only place in the country that isn't in drought is the Southeast, and that's because they were hit by hurricanes. This was a very active hurricane season. I'm sure you've heard this on the news. We had 30 named storms, 13 hurricanes, and six major hurricanes, 12 of which hit the United States. This season stayed unusually active into October and November, and the last category five, the latest category five storm ever to hit here was on November, it didn't hit here, it hit other places, but it was that late in November, November 16th. So these warm ocean and sea surface temperatures that are indicators of a warming planet are fueling these intense hurricanes, making this one of the most intense hurricane seasons on record. So there's this new science where scientists can now link these extreme weather events to carbon dioxide in the atmosphere from the burning of fossil fuels. And so more atmospheric carbon dioxide boosts the odds of having these extreme weather events and punishing storms. And in 2016, the National Academy of Sciences released this statement. And what they said was as the climate has warmed over the years, a new pattern of more frequent and more intense weather events is unfolding in the United States and across the globe. And because of this new rapidly advancing area of science called event attribution, we can now estimate how climate change increases the risk to society from some of these types of extreme events. So this event attribution is really new cutting edge science and it helps us to understand what our future storms might look like based on the CO2 in the atmosphere. And in fact, Hurricane Florence was the first forecasted storm with an attribution statement. And in the forecast, they said that the rainfall will be significantly increased by 50% and the storm will be 80 kilometers in diameter larger because of the human interference in the climate system. First ever statement written, released like that. And when they did the retrospective analysis of the, the, the forecast, it held up. So it was a very good forecast. And now you can imagine there's a lot of public interest in the science of attribution. So let's just talk about weather and climate. First, weather is a given set of conditions at any point in time, right? Yesterday it rained, today it was sunny. When we talk about climate, we look at the average set of conditions over a 30 year period. So you could think of this like weather is your mood today, whereas climate is your personality. So this is how it happens. 
Our planet is hit with solar radiation from the sun and much of that heat is absorbed, which allows us to live here and have a comfortable life. Some of it is reflected back off into the atmosphere. And surrounding our planet is this blanket made up of all different types of gases. And as we burn, carbon, as we burn fossil fuels, we put more carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, making this blanket thicker. So just like if you were in bed and you added a big quilt, you'd get a little bit warmer and you might even get a little bit sweatier. And that's what's happening to our planet as we put more greenhouse gases into the blanket that surrounds us. And over the past 50 years, the average global temperature has increased at the fastest rate in recorded history. And this is due to the burning of fossil fuels, both for transportation and electricity generation. And transportation is number one now, and that just flipped in 2016 because we've moved away from electricity generation from coal-fired power plants. We're using more natural gas, which is still a fossil fuel, but it has less greenhouse gas emissions. We're seeing some efficiency initiatives. We need more, and we're seeing some um, renewable energy on the grid as well. So transportation is our number one contributor now to these greenhouse gases. So this global warming causes the climate to change. Those greenhouse gases trap heat, warm our atmosphere, change the water cycle, warm oceans, melt glaciers, and cause sea levels to rise. And it also affects plant growth because plants love carbon dioxide. And this all started during the Industrial Revolution. We became very mechanized. We were burning fossil fuels. We were creating great things. It was an industrious time for us. And since that time, we have raised the atmospheric carbon dioxide levels from 280 parts per million to 411 parts per million. And we know this because we can measure it. And the way we measure it is scientists like Dr. Cameron Wake pictured here with his team of scientists in Nepal. And they're drilling down through those glaciers. You can see the ice core in their hands. And they drill down and pull up ice that they then analyze and they can take thin sections of the ice or they can melt it to see what are the constituents of our atmosphere when that layer of ice was laid down. And in the image in the lower right, you can see those black blobs. Those are, are elements of carbon, they indicate carbon dioxide that was in the atmosphere when that layer of ice was laid down. So we can learn a lot through ice cores and drilling into our past to understand what our atmosphere was like but we need to know what's happening now as well. And we're doing ambient monitoring or background monitoring of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases at Mauna Loa in Hawaii, where we've been collecting data since 1956 and at other stations around the planet. So we have a very good record of what's going on with carbon dioxide in our atmosphere. And so now let's take this graph and think that we're looking down one of those ice cores and here's the Industrial Revolution, and we're looking all the way down one of those ice cores back 400,000 years. And this shows us the concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And you can see that there's natural fluctuations in the carbon dioxide. But what you see is it never goes above 300 parts per million. And as I said, at the Industrial Revolution, we are 280. Well, here we are today. So we are seeing a concentration of carbon dioxide in our atmosphere that we have not seen in over 400,000, even going out farther to a million years. And that's interesting and sort of riveting, but this is even more interesting. When you overlay temperature to carbon dioxide, you see a strong mirroring of temperature and carbon dioxide. When carbon dioxide's low, temperatures are low. When carbon dioxide's high, temperatures are high. So you can expect that if that strong mirroring is going to continue, we're gonna see a warmer planet with a higher amount of carbon dioxide in our atmosphere. And in fact, we are. The 10 hottest record, the 10 hottest years on record globally have been all since the 2000s. And the last five have been the hottest five. And I was just reading before this meeting that they think 2020 is gonna come in in the top three there, probably between 2019 and 2016, depending on how the rest of this year pans out. So as the planet warms, it doesn't do so uniformly. And the difference between the temperature at the Arctic and the mid-latitudes 
is what keeps this jet stream moving in a very predictable and solid pattern. It keeps that cold air in the high latitudes and the warmer air in the lower latitudes. But since the Arctic is warming, that temperature difference isn't as great. And what happens is it causes that jet stream to start to wobble and to become very unpredictable and to get locked in. And this first we started talking about in about February 2015 when they were talking about the polar vortex. And we were freezing, we had tons of snow, everybody was cranky while Alaska was really warm and they had to move the Iditarod dog sled race farther north and truck in snow for the start. So we're seeing this wobbly jet stream causing these different patterns and they lock in for a long time. And we first started seeing it at the polar vortex. And here's an image from the polar vortex of last year where we have that Arctic blast covering our country while most of the other parts of the planet were warmer than average. So this jet stream changing also happens in the summer. And during the summer, because warm air holds more moisture, and when it's hit with a hurricane, that moisture manifests as intense rainfall. And we've seen this when we've seen some hurricanes like Sandy or Harvey, where it dumped 60 inches of rain on Houston, Florence, 30 to 40 inches of rain in North Carolina. So this, this changing jet stream is something that we really need to pay attention to. And it's projected to increase by 50% if these emissions go unchecked. So we are changing our atmospheric currents. Now let's talk about our ocean currents. First, if you look at this image, you can see with the temperature scale at the bottom that in general, the, the ocean temperatures are warmer than average. Now let's look at this ribbon and let's think of it as a conveyor belt. And so what happens is warm surface waters move into the northern latitudes where they are cooled and cold salt water is more dense than warm salt water. So that cold salt water drops down deep into the ocean and forms a deep ocean current that swings down through and feeds this cycle again and again. So what's happening is because the Arctic and Greenland are melting at such an incredible rate, they're dumping cold, fresh water into the system. So when these warm surface waters move up in here, they're getting cold, but they're getting diluted. So they're not as salty, so they're not as dense, so they're not dropping down. So this whole system is very, very sluggish. We have not seen a sluggish system like this in a thousand years. And you know this if you've gone swimming in the ocean the past few summers. The area off our coast is called the Gulf of Maine, and the Gulf of Maine is warming seven times faster than the rest of the ocean because of this Gulf Stream weakening. So we're altering our ocean currents as well as our atmospheric currents. So luckily for us, we have local and regional climate assessments that were put together by Dr. Cameron Wake and his team at UNH. And I'll discuss some of the projections from the Northern and Southern one at the end of the presentation. But what we've learned from these, these assessments that Cameron and his team have done is we've already seen an increase in precipitation in New Hampshire in both rain and snow, and it's happening with greater amounts and greater intensity. We've seen these increases in average temperatures with more increase in temperature in the winter, increases in extreme weather, changing seasonality, lake ice out is changing, and um, Andrea will talk more about that. We're seeing periods of drought, and we do see sea level rise in coastal New Hampshire today. Portsmouth's sea level rise has already risen six inches since 1926, and we're seeing weekly high tide flooding in Hampton. People cannot park their cars on the street once a week in Hampton, New Hampshire. And when sea level rises, groundwater rises. So we see an increase in groundwater levels as well. So here's some illustrations. We've already seen a 71% increase in very heavy precipitation in the Northeast. We're seeing this winter warming upwards of four and five degrees in New Hampshire since 1970. And then we're seeing these periods of drought. This was the 2016 drought. Again, a pretty significant drought for us here in New Hampshire. And then here's images of sea level rise. These are taken at a king tide, which has nothing to do with climate change. It's just some of our highest tides of the year. But you see Hampton there. It's a beautiful day and the streets are flooded. So this is a big concern. Our coastal region is very vulnerable. So I just want to back out and say climate change is real. 
99% of climate scientists agree that climate warming trends are due to human activity. And it's already occurring. We can see the impacts of climate change in our communities across the country. And these extreme events damage our infrastructure, they hurt our local economies, and they impact the vitality of our communities. So what are we gonna do? Well, we have a choice. We can do nothing and just hope for the best, or we can start to reduce our use of fossil fuels to reduce the amount of carbon dioxide going into the atmosphere. And we can also begin to adapt. And we need to be able to adapt to the current impacts as well as our future impacts. So now let's talk about the future. What are we going to face here in New Hampshire? So first, let me orient you to the, the color schemes of these graphs. Okay, this is from the Southern New Hampshire report and this is from the Northern New Hampshire report. This is from about Plymouth South and this is Plymouth North. Actually Plymouth, Tamworth and Romney are right in between. So you, you'll have to see which ones apply to your community more. The gray bars indicate historical and how, how, it, how the climate was during that 30 year period. The blue bars indicate if we have a lower emission scenario where we're doing something to reduce our impacts and by reducing our fossil fuel emissions. And the red are business as usual, if we just continue what we're doing and continue emitting. We are currently in a high emission scenario. So really you've got to pay attention to the red bars. And the other thing I want to note is these scales right here are not the same on the Northern and Southern because you, it, it has to account for the differences in the regions. So when we think about heat, and the average number of days over 90 degrees per year, as we move out into the century, we're proje projected to see about 10 days over 90 degrees in Southern New Hampshire. But remember that slide I showed you earlier? We already saw 30 days over 90 degrees. So that was projected to 2040 and we're ahead of that projection. In the North, you're not seeing as great a warming, but you still are seeing much more warming than we've had historically. If you're a gardener like me, you might think, oh, a future growing season is going to be longer and that's exciting. Well, the future growing season is expected to lengthen by two to five weeks, depending on the emission scenario in the region. But because these hotter temperatures and reduced chilling at night, as well as the extreme weather events are going to happen, it will probably decrease our crop yields. And in terms of precipitation, in either scenario, in either region, we are expected to see an increase of 17 to 20 percent of, of precipitation by the end of the century. And these increases in pre precipitation cause problems, big for lakes, right? Because it's extensive runoff, it damages critical infrastructure and de degrades water quality. <clears throat> and if you like to play in the winter, this is a very sad slide. Historically, in the north, we've seen 140 days of snow covered surfaces, in the south, 105, but they're both going to diminish considerably. And in the south, we may only have 52 days of snow covered in the winter. In the north, we'll have 100, but all the southern ski areas probably won't be able to operate. And if you have to, if you like to cross country ski, you're going to have to go north. And that's just a huge impact to New Hampshire's economy, as well as our happiness. So, and then there's exacerbating issues, right? Our population is likely to increase, and we've already seen some of this with COVID-19. People are moving to rural areas because they don't want to be in, in dense areas. But with climate, people might be moving from areas hit by hurricanes or intense wildfires. So as more people move into our area, there'll be more development. More development causes more pavement. More pavement causes more runoff. People are going to build homes in risky areas. And currently our infrastructure is already undersized. So there's gonna be more problems with infrastructure. At the same time, federal funding for these programs has completely diminished. And there's a lot of politics around these issues. And I'm sure we could talk more about these exacerbating issues. But what I want to remind you is we need to do both. We need to reduce our fossil fuel use. It saves money now and into the future. And then we need to adapt. If we start proactively adapting, we can save us ourselves money a, a fair amount. For every dollar invested now in adaptation, it saves us $7 in recovery. So we've met environmental conditions in the past, environmental challenges in the past, and we can do it again. We were very concerned about smog 
There was a national effort to install catalytic converters on all vehicles, and we reduced smog by 30 to 50%. Remember, we were very concerned about the hole in the ozone layer that was attributed to the use of chlorofluorocarbons. Well, there was an international agreement to phase out chlorofluorocarbons, and they've been all but eliminated, and our ozone layer is slowly rebounding. We were very concerned about acid rain in the Northeast because it was hurting our lakes. The solution was a market-based program for regulating utility sulfur dioxide emissions. It's a cap and trade program, and it worked. Air acid rain emissions are cut by 50%, our forests are rebounding, and our lakes are slowly recovering. And this cap and trade system is what is in place currently in the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, and it's working to decrease regional greenhouse gases in the 10 northeastern states. It's also what was proposed in the Clean Power Plan. So we do have a system that works in place that we could put forth to decrease our carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gas emissions through the proposed clean power plan. So hopefully the new administration will pick that up. So we need to make the connections because climate change is gonna cost us a half a trillion dollars this decade and trillions more into the future unless we mitigate the impacts. We can't ignore the impacts of climate change on our public health, our environment and our economy and these lessons will continue to be taught until they are learned. So we've got to connect the dots. So you've got to understand what you see around you. These extreme weather events are all examples of how our climate is changing. And we can do this together by sharing voices, state agencies, groups like yours, conservation groups, schools, everyone. We need to let our decision makers know that this is an important issue for us and we want to see things addressed. At this point in time, I'd be happy to take some questions. Thank you, Sherry. That was so informative. And I think what we'll do here is I will um, just go over the lake stuff okay. um, quickly, and then we'll open it up uh, to everyone for questions. I know we've already got a bunch of questions in the chat box, and you might want to take it, start taking a look at those. OK. Um, and I'll, I'll stop, share. Awesome. Thank you. There you go. Thank you. Let's see if I can pull up. All right. This is not the one I want. Hold on. Uh, let's see here. Of course, I had this all queued up and ready to go. Here we are. And now let's see here, share. All right, hopefully you guys can see that. All right, thank you for the nod. Okay, well, that's a hard act to follow. Sherry had a lot of great information. I'm just gonna kind of take this from a high elevation and, and uh, Sherry alluded to a lot of impacts um, that, and I, that could affect our lakes and I just wanted to sort of bring those into a little bit more focus. Um, the good news is, right, New Hampshire, we all know this, is home to some of the cleanest and healthiest lakes in the country. But our lakes in New Hampshire are showing more and more signs of being stressed. Uh, this here is a picture of a cyanobacteria bloom in one of our lakes. And if cyanobacteria is a new term to you, um, that's good news because it means you probably haven't seen it on your lake. But cyanobacteria is basically something you don't want to see in your lake. Um, it's technically a bacteria that functions like an algae, but long story short, it can be toxic and it can be dangerous to you and your pets and other wildlife. Um, unfortunately, we're seeing more and more of this in our lakes. Climate change is making um, our, is stressing our lakes out even more. So our lakes are under stress and climate change is not helping. Weather extremes are having extreme impacts on the health of our lakes. And I know many of you know this from your personal experience. Uh, so extreme impacts on the health of our lakes and in extreme impacts in some instances on our personal enjoyment of our lakes and also on our local and state economy. And I'm just going to spend a few minutes going through 
uh, each of these five issues, flooding, drought, uh, water quality, ice in, ice, ice cover, and um, plants and invasive species. So um, as we heard, we are actually experiencing slightly more rain these days in New Hampshire. Generally, um, they are in fewer but more intense, more extreme events uh, leading to um, causing periods of flooding and then periods of drought. Flooding, as Sherry uh, mentioned, is really not good for our lakes. Uh, big rain precipitation events, big snow melt events carry very large volumes of runoff water into our lakes. Runoff water, water that goes over the landscape, typically picks up pollutants um, on the landscape, uh, like nutrients from fertilizer, um, bacteria from pet waste, uh, road salt. Uh, runoff washes pollutants into our lake, uh, primarily the nutrients that fuel the growth of plants, um, native plants and also invasive plants, plants we don't want, algae, and dangerous forms of um, bacteria and that toxic cyanobacteria I was talking about. And this year, um, the Department of Environmental Services helps to monitor our lakes for toxic cyanobacteria. And this is generally not the sign you want to see. Um, when you want to go jump in the lake. Um, so they issue uh, advisories for when high levels of toxic cyanobacteria are observed in a water body. Periods of drought are not good for our lakes either. Um, here we see some pictures of some um, access and navigation hazards. Um, you know, um, this summer I went to plenty of lakes. There's actually um, uh, one of uh, the lakes up in uh, Pittsburgh that we do our lake host boat inspection program at. One of the lake ramps there, the lake host called me up one day and said, what should I do? The water has receded the boat launch. The ramp doesn't even reach the lake. I was like, what do you mean? He's like, well, no one can launch their boat today because the lake's too low. So that's an access issue. Um, Middle slide, middle picture here, you know, we're not called the granite state for, for nothing. Uh, we have big boulders in the middle of our lakes and with lower water levels, more people are hitting those, those boulders and damaging their boats. This here in the, the right picture is more reservoir up in the Connecticut River region. It's, this is um, very low water levels. That's a drinking water supply. So, you know, Drought causes all a variety of issues, access issues, navigation issues, uh, water supply issues. As Sherry um, alluded, mentioned, um, on average, ice in, so the period, the, the date at which in late fall, early winter that our, I, that our lakes, you know, cover with ice, um, ice in is, in is generally occurring later and ice out, the period when the ice, you know, cover leaves the lake is occurring earlier on average. This is creating a shorter period of ice cover. This means that there's a longer growing season for plants in the lake, um, invasive plants too, so a longer season for your the milfoil to be growing or the fan wart, and potentially a longer season for that algae and then that toxic cyanobacteria, again the, that bacteria we don't want in our lakes. So longer plant growing season in our lakes is really not something we, we want to see. A shorter period of ice cover and less solid ice cover reduces the opportunities for on ice activities. Uh, you know, our lakes usually um, are pretty popular during the winter. You know, we get a whole an additional season of recreation with an ice cover and plenty of different sports out there. Uh, we, you know, we, we have a lot of fishing derbies. Uh, pretty cool fact, we have the only um, ice runway in the lower 48 states in Alton Bay on Lake Winnipesaukee. Uh, unfortunately, last, last winter it was not able to open because the ice was not uh, consistent or thick enough. Um, that was one of the first years in, in a while that they weren't able to open. Um, and our, our lakes are really popular. Um, this is, if you've ever been to the big lake, um, this is a, the big pond hockey tournament, several uh, pond hockey um, enthusiasts out there. So lots of opportunity usually for on ice rec recreation and a lot that recreation obviously brings in a lot of tourism, tourism revenue that's really important to our local and statewide economy. 
in general, we talked, we learned from Sherry that um, we're, we're warming, our air is warming, we're, we're having, you know, warmer temperatures. Generally speaking, the warmer the water is, the, the more um, active the bio biology is. So warmer summer lake water temperatures are fueling more plant growth, more algae growth, more bacteria growth, and again, more of that cyanobacteria growth. Um, and here is a a sign you also don't want to see when you go to jump in the lake, the DES is saying, hey, you may not want to jump in here because we found high levels of bacteria in this water body. With warmer air temperatures, this is a, a bit of a science lesson here. For those of you who have been tuning into us, you've seen these slides before and learned a little bit more about how our lakes, um, the physics of our lakes with temperature and density. But generally speaking, our deeper lakes in the summer warm up at the top and then some of that heat gets transferred down. But our, our deeper lakes usually end up being, um, they're layered. They, they have a warm, a warm layer of water at the top that's not very dense, um, sitting on um, down below a really cold, dense layer of water and then a layer of rapidly changing um, temperature and density water in the middle. But anyway, this is called lake stratification. And what happens normally um, in our lakes, deeper lakes during the summer is the oxygen, you know, starts to get used up as plants and algae and stuff fall down to the bottom and all the decomposers use up the oxygen. And what happens is nutrients start to build up. Um, in the bottom layer when the oxygen is used up. So with warmer temperatures, our lakes may stratify into those three different layers earlier in the summer and stay stratified for longer, which gives the lake, which will likely result in more depletion or more oxygen being used up at the lake bottom. And what happens then is Again, if you've been tuning into us, you've learned about in the fall at some point our lakes, you know, that become the same temperature from the top to the bottom because of cooling and wind and they mix all up. Well, if more nutrients built up in the bottom of the lake, because there was more, a longer period of no oxygen, those extra nutrients are going to get mixed into the lake during the fall and can again fuel algae and cyanobacteria blooms. And this is just a clip from our partners at the Department of Environmental Services, warning of late season cyanobacteria blooms in New Hampshire. So unfortunately this fall and even up until um, some point in November, I've been seeing you know, press releases about late season cyanobacteria blooms, you know, potentially from those lakes mixing up, mixing that nutrients from the bottom waters um, up into the rest of the lake, you know, later in the season. Um, so again, you don't want to see that when you go to your favorite lake. And in general, as our lakes warm, new invasive species may survive and thrive in our lakes. Right now, the biggest invasive plants in our lakes are uh, fanwort and milfoil, but we're worried about if our lakes start to really warm up, invasive plants that might do really well, like say in Virginia, you know, might start to find out that they can move northward and survive in our lakes too. Um, and, and no one wants to swim through a, a bed of invasive species, it's pretty nasty. So that's just a real high, quick overview of how some of what Sherry talked about may, you know, is already translating to um, our changing lakes, the, cha the way, you know, a different way in which we can use them and how it's impacting, you know, generally our, our local lake economies and our state economy. So the changing climate is making our work with New Hampshire lakes and, and, and all of your work for those of you, I know those of you tuning in tonight really care about your lakes. Um, it's making our work for clean and healthy lakes, lakes more challenging, but it's making our work more important than ever. So I am going to stop chatting now and turn to Crystal and Jessica for them to start throwing some questions. And I know Sherry's got a bunch of questions for Sherry. Okay. Well, uh, First of all, I just want to say, Sherry, that was a wonderful presentation. It was uh, it was very eye opening, and um, you know, I think I've gotten in the habit of really only thinking about my local area in recent years, and just to see a broader perspective um, 
it was good. So thank you. <laughs> so we do have some some good questions, and Jessica, maybe you and I can just uh, volley back and forth here. Uh, the first one was about the global travel reduction due to the pandemic, and um, this attendee is wondering if that uh, reduction in travel has made any real meaningful contribution to alleviating CO2 trends. Obviously, we've seen, you know, a little bit of a decrease, but has it mattered that much in the long run? So great question. I'm glad you asked that. I get that question every time I present. And um, there's a difference between emissions and concentrations, right? So what we, what we emit out our car driving wherever we go is one thing. The concentration in the atmosphere is a, is a little bit different. And when you think about changing something as big as our atmosphere, just from, you know, one teeny pandemic, it, it isn't going to happen. So while we did see a decrease in transportation, the concentration in our atmosphere really didn't decrease that much. And so we saw less travel, we saw less plane travel, but we did see an uptick in home deliveries, right? So everybody's got an Amazon Prime truck going down their roads these days. Um, so, so overall, there was not a huge decrease in emissions during the pandemic, and it did not change the concentration of carbon dioxide in our atmosphere at all. It was actually a bit higher at, in the end of September. Hmm. I feel guilty. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure we all do. <laughs> I know, I know I leaned a little heavily on Amazon Prime. <laughs> I have a great question, um, Sherry. Um, if electricity generation um, is a major contributor to CO2 and greenhouse gases, um, are there any climate benefits um, with the advent of electric vehicles? Yes. Great question. So electric vehicles, and I had the same question myself when I first started learning about electric vehicles, but if you have, um, even if it's a fossil fuel burning facility, you have a lot of controls on that fossil fuel burning facility, more controls than are on vehicles to reduce these emissions. So going to an electric vehicle situation is a very good thing to do in conjunction with changing the source of what's providing the electricity, right? So we wanna see more renewables online and there are more renewables online and we wanna see more efficiency in our use of electricity. So, so those things will help to decrease the overall emissions but electric vehicles are definitely a, a, a way to go. And New Hampshire is behind in our electrical, electric vehicle infrastructure and use compared to the rest of New England, which impacts our economy. Because if you are driving, <clears throat> Um, say Connecticut to Maine, and you don't know if you can charge up in New Hampshire, you're going to avoid New Hampshire, you're going to go through Massachusetts, well I guess you can't totally avoid New Hampshire, but you're only going to go through a little bit of New Hampshire so you don't have that, it's called um, charge anxiety. It's like if you couldn't get to the gas station to fuel your vehicle. So it, it, we do need to up our electric vehicle infrastructure and we're trying to, we're, we're working on that right now. Okay, um, the next question is, uh, it's an interesting one um, regarding uh, saltwater intrusion. Has there been any significant research on saltwater intrusion in freshwater ground wells on the seacoast? There already is freshwater, saltwater intrusion in the seacoast, yes. Oh. The groundwater comes up, it's coming into areas and people are pumping their drinking water from a groundwater well. And if you're a large development and everybody wants a green lawn and everybody's pumping water, they're literally sucking salt water into their drinking water. And there's a number of community systems that need to have a different source now because we are seeing salt water intrusion into our, in our drinking water in coastal New Hampshire. That sounds like an expensive problem for people to deal with. <laughs> it is. It's very expensive. Wow. Um, Jessica, are there any other questions that we missed in the chat box? No, I th those that was it. So if anyone has any other burning questions, feel free to pop them in the Yeah, chat shoot box. them in. Um, I have uh, a question, Sherry, for going into winter. Obviously, uh, a lot of us on private wells are you know, being warned to be mindful for the purpose of 
you know, the drought that we've been in and the inability for our wells to recharge over the winter. Um, if you could give one final plug for water conservation leading into winter, uh, what would you what would you tell all of us? What I would tell all of you who have a private well, and I've been doing this since 2016, is get a bucket and put it in your shower. And when you go to take a shower, you have that water fall into your bucket until it gets warm. And then you bend over and take the bucket out of the shower, take your shower. You will be surprised how much water you waste just warming up your shower water. And then I use that the, the water in my bucket to wash out my recycling bins, to water my plants. There's a hundred things you can do with that kind of water. So be mindful of how you use water when you're doing the dishes. Don't let the water run, turn it off. And the more mindful you are, the more you will set that routine for yourself. And when we do come out of the drought, you can still practice these efficiency practices because it's not hard to do at all. So that would be my one plug. Be mindful. That Yes, we, even with this rain that we've gotten, we have not recharged our groundwater sufficiently. Northern areas more so, but that area of extreme drought in Rockingham and Stratford County is still in drought. I live there, so I'm- Yeah, I do too. Yeah, so, <laughs> yep, be careful. Well, thank you. That was a that was a good and and really creative tip. Um, we'll, <laughs> we'll grab a, a five gallon bucket out of the, out of the cellar. <laughs> Back to you, Andrea. Yeah, I'm just imagining having my 12 year old do this tomorrow with the five gallon bucket. So thank you for the tip, Sherry. <laughs> I, hope you, I hope you have a tiled floor so you can mop. <laughs> <laughs> well, wow, I really wanna thank, um, thank you, Sherry, and thank everyone uh, for joining us this evening. Um, as I mentioned before, um, in, in 15 minutes or so, you'll get an evaluation email from us. Please let us know how you did and please let us know what you want to learn about in the future. Uh, tomorrow, you will receive an email from me with links to this recording and links to um, the slides. And um, please plan to join us um, in January um, for uh, Crystal and I to fill you in on all the cool and interesting things that happen um, to our lakes in winter. Um, but before I turn it, um, before we say goodnight, I wanted to um, turn it back over to Sherry. Is there any last things you wanted to share with the group or? Um, Sure, I, I think that you know we're all pretty mindful people. If we all care about the lakes that we are, our, our favorite lakes in the state, and I think that we can be leaders in this. And it's not hard to be mindful about your fossil fuel use. It's, it's not hard at all. And so I think if we can sh show others by example, how we can do it, we can help ensure that there's a planet that's livable for the next generations. So please think about that. Thank you. Awesome. Well, thank you, Sherry. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Have a wonderful rest of the month. Enjoy the holidays. Be safe. And I look forward to seeing all of you next year um, in January. I think it's January 6th. So uh, take care and be well. Thank Good night. You. Bye.